Welcome back to Physics 371 Online. Today we begin our discussion of material from Chapter 6 which deals with magnetic fields applied to matter and the way that the atoms composed of electrons in matter responds to applied magnetic fields. So we'll begin with a discussion today of diamagnetism, paramagnetism, and ferromagnetism. When an external magnetic field is applied to a material, the kind of phenomena that can happen is, are much richer than what we have when electric fields are applied to matter. There are several different types of behavior possible in this case. First, diamagnetism, which is when a material acquires a magnetization or an alignment of the internal magnetic moments opposite to the applied B. The prefix dia in this context means against. Secondly, paramagnetism. Here the prefix para, the same as in the word parallel, means along. And in this case, the material acquires a magnetization parallel to the applied magnetic field due to a reorientation of the internal magnetic dipole moments. And finally, ferromagnetism. And you can think of ferromagnetism as a special case of paramagnetism, which is uh, when an external magnetic field aligns the internal dipole moments and so there's a magnetization that's acquired parallel to the applied magnetic field but this magnetization stays in the material even after the field is removed and when we think of magnets usually we're thinking of materials like iron nickel and cobalt which under the right conditions are ferromagnetic they stay magnetized even when they're taken out of the external magnetic field but in all cases the origin of magnetic phenomena is the same and it always comes from electric charges in motion. Now let's talk about these briefly in turn. First paramagnetism. What is paramagnetism? It comes as a result of the torque that an external magnetic field exerts on the dipole moment of electrons in atoms. Electrons in atoms act as you might imagine like tiny current loops. These current loops you can think of in the Bohr model as electrons uh, orbiting nuclei. So these electrons have magnetic dipole moments uh, and the applied magnetic field produces a torque. So in this diagram the uh, magnetic dipole moment M is oriented in the vertical direction and a magnetic field B is applied and that magnetic field produces a torque that tends to rotate the magnetic dipole moment. And the symbol N, representing the torque in this case, is M cross B, where M is the magnetic dipole moment and B is the external field. And you can see by use of the right hand rule that this torque will tend to align or rotate the magnetic dipole moment toward the direction of the applied magnetic field. And you might remember that we had a very similar expression when we talked about the effect of electric fields on electric dipole moments. In that case we had the expression P cross E where P was the electric dipole moment. So these two expressions are very closely analogous. The torque tends to line the dipole moments up with the applied field and this is expressed uh, through the potential energy expression U is equal to minus M dot B. So you see M cross B gives us the torque, uh, negative M dot B gives us the potential energy of the magnetic dipole moment in the presence of this magnetic field. And the minus sign is there because when M and B are parallel that is the most favorable or the lowest energy configuration and the minus sign guarantees that. You might also remember, although I'm not writing it down here, that for an electric dipole moment in the presence of an electric field, we had a similar expression. The potential energy was minus P dot E. So once again, we see echoes of the same physics in the case of magnetic fields that we saw with electric fields. The alignment of the individual dipoles with this applied magnetic field is the origin of paramagnetism. And you might imagine if this is going on with all of the atoms, the electrons orbiting all of the atoms in the solid, then all of their individual dipole moments, which originally might be all jumbled up, pointing in different directions, they will all then tend to align with the applied field.
However, something that we have to remember is that many atoms and molecules have electrons that are paired up and these electrons have dipole moments in opposite directions. So for them, the net paramagnetism will be zero, right? Because their dipole moments point opposite to each other. So as a result, when we actually do measurements on real materials, paramagnetism, this kind of a response where the magnetic dipole moments line up with the applied field, it's found only in atoms and molecules that have one or more unpaired electrons. And so we'll do some examples of this, and you, you're asked uh, to evaluate for homework which kinds of atoms or molecules uh, might be expected to exhibit paramagnetism. Now diamagnetism uh, arises due to a different effect, and that is the effect of an applied field on the orbital motion of electrons. Rather than just realizing that the electrons uh, circling the nuclei in atoms have a dipole moment that gets rotated, well, in diamagnetism, the effect of the applied magnetic field uh, causes a change in the orbital motion, which results in a change in the magnetic dipole moment itself. And to, to see where this comes from, we're going to use a semi-classical model where we imagine that we can use the Bohr model. We can see electrons making circular orbits around the nucleus. In this case, this would apply for a hydrogen atom. And we've got an electron with charge minus e and mass m sub e moving with a speed v in a circular path of radius r around the nucleus. And so for the purpose of the discussion that follows, the z-axis is pointing out of the page. So uh, let's first calculate the magnetic dipole moment of this electron making this kind of a circular orbit. First we need the current. The current is charge per unit time. And so that's the charge on the electron divided by the period of the electron's orbit. 2 pi r over v, which gives us eV over 2 pi r. That's the effective current on average that the electron uh, produces as it orbits a nucleus. So the orbital magnetic moment, we remember the definition of m was, for a planar loop anyway, was i times the area vector. The area vector, according to the right-hand rule, will point in the positive z direction. So we plug in for the current. Uh, oh, but then we remember that because the electron is negatively charged, that its electric dipole moment is actually going to point in the negative z direction, right? Because the current in this diagram, even though the electron orbits counterclockwise, the current would actually be in the clockwise direction. So the uh, area vector, of course, is minus uh, pi r squared z hat, the minus sign due to the uh, electron's negative charge, so we get negative EVR over 2 z hat. So that's the electron's orbital magnetic moment in the absence of any magnetic field. And what we now want to consider is what happens when a magnetic field is applied in the z direction. So in this case there's going to be an additional centripetal force. And you can work this out using the Lorentz force law because remember it's QV cross B so if the B is out of the page, then V cross B would point, for the electron in this location, it would point away from the nucleus, but the electron is negatively charged, so the force is actually toward the nucleus. So this force, which is going to have a magnitude of E V B, that will be directed toward the center of the circle. So first, let's look at the uh, relationship for the force that the electron feels in the absence of any magnetic field. Here, the Coulomb force is simply, for circular motion, equal to mv squared over r. All right, we're familiar with that. But now, when we turn on the magnetic field, there's going to be an additional centripetal force, right? So that e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, that's the force that the nucleus exerts on the electron, plus this new Lorentz force, eV prime b, is equal to MeV prime squared over R. Now what's going on here? What we've assumed is that the electron's speed has changed from V to V prime, right? And so the new force towards the nucleus is EV prime B, and then because the electron still maintains circular motion, but now is moving at a different speed, V prime, then on the right hand side this has to be MV prime squared over R. Note, too, that we are assuming here that even though the electron's speed changes, that the change in radius is negligible. 
And this, of course, is for the case where b is non-zero. So what we notice with these two equations is that uh, the mv squared over r for the electron before the field is turned on is equal to this e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And that term also appears in the second equation. So on the next slide, what I'll do is take the mv squared over r and put it on the left-hand side of the second equation in place of the Coulomb force. All right? So we'll just do that here. So now we've got mv squared over r plus ev prime b equals mv prime squared over r. All right? And what we want to do is solve for the change in the velocity due to the magnetic field. In other words, the, the v prime minus v. One thing that you'll see in this equation is it shows us pretty clearly that v prime must be greater than v. And that makes sense. That's expected. If we exert greater force on the electron, pulling it in toward the center, then it should speed up. Right? So v prime is greater than v. Well, let's go through the algebra now. Uh, if we solve for ev prime b, that gives us m times the difference in the squares of the velocities over r. And now we note that the difference of two squares can be factored. So we have me over r, v prime minus v times v prime plus v. And now we can make a useful approximation. Uh, we'll assume that the, for a small magnetic field, that the change in the electron's velocity is relatively small. So what that allows us to do, we'll, we'll define v prime minus v as delta v, right? That's what we actually want to solve for. But if v prime and v are very close together, then v prime plus v is approximately 2 v prime. And so that allows this equation to be rewritten on the right-hand side as me over r times delta v times 2 v prime, just making these two substitutions. And that makes it easy now to solve for delta v. Delta v is, because the v prime terms cancel, delta v is ebr over twice the electron mass. And what's cool about this is, now we can write down an expression for how much the electron's magnetic dipole moment has changed because of the application of the magnetic field. On the previous slide, we had an expression for m, the dipole moment of the electron, and it was in terms of v, the electron speed. So what we'll do now is go back to that formula and replace v with delta v, because that will give us the change in the dipole moment. So this causes a change in the orbital dipole moment. Delta m, which is negative e, delta vr over 2 z hat. And if you go back to the previous slide, you'll see that the original equation was m, had m on the left-hand side, and just v in parentheses. So, of course, if v changes, then m will change as well. All right, and what we can do now is take this delta v, right, and substitute for it in order to get the final expression for the change in the dipole moment. And note that it's negative. The change in m is opposite to the applied magnetic field. And this is due to the negative charge of the electron. So, the significance is as follows. For a b, in the positive z direction, the dipole moment increases in the opposite direction. So unlike paramagnetism, an applied magnetic field, in this case, produces a magnetization response in the opposite direction. This is the origin of diamagnetism. And diamagnetism, when we turn a magnetic field on and apply it to a piece of matter, it affects the motion of all the electrons. So all materials will have some kind of diamagnetism exhibited when we turn on a magnetic field. However, it's typically, in terms of its strength, it's typically much weaker than paramagnetism. And so, as a result, if you've got a material that has both paramagnetism and diamagnetism present, usually the paramagnetism wins out. It has a stronger net effect. And as a result, we usually only observe diamagnetism directly for atoms and molecules where paramagnetism is absent. And if you remember, just a minute ago I said paramagnetism will be absent when electrons are all paired up so that their net magnetic moments uh, add up to be zero. So for those kinds of materials, we will see diamagnetism. But even when we don't measure it, diamagnetism is always present in all materials.
So finally, we'll just wrap up by saying a few words about ferromagnetism. Uh, ferromagnetism, remember, is when you apply an external field to line up the individual magnetic dipole moments of the atoms, and they stay lined up even when the magnetic field is turned off. So what this must imply is somehow the individual magnetic dipole moments on adjacent atoms inside the material interact with each other really strongly so that once you get them lined up then even when you turn off the external field they keep each other lined up and that's the interesting phenomenon known as ferromagnetism and a little bit later near the end of the chapter we'll consider a very simple model for how this behavior occurs. So that gives you a basic overview of paramagnetism, diamagnetism, and ferromagnetism, and we will uh, jump into the magnetic field produced by a magnetized object in the next section. I'll see you in class.